This is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 32 through verse 35. Paul says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who's no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 9 through 13. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Let me pray. Father, would you be with us this morning by your spirit? Uh, Help me to speak words um, of life and hope from your word for your people uh, this morning to comfort us, to encourage us, to uh, help us to go deeper uh, into the life of God uh, among us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I begin, I want to give a shout out uh, to many of you singles uh, here who have shared with me some of your stories um, and your resources. And this morning, when I share your stories and have your OkCupid okay profiles on the screen, I will redact your name. Just kidding. <laughs> Wouldn't that be terrible? Uh, especially a shout out to uh, Laura Michael, who herself is becoming um, quite a uh, significant voice in the world of, of dating and uh, Christian dating and Christian singleness. Uh, she blogs and grams at Just Beautifully Honest, and she was a great help in pointing me to some resources. I want to begin this morning with an essay um, by, an excerpt from an essay by Carrie English that appeared in the Boston Globe a few years back, many of us can relate to her experience. She says, in the vows they wrote, the bride and groom gushed about how lucky they were to have found someone who loved them unconditionally, someone who made any place home, someone who was their best friend. And I stood there under the flower-covered gazebo thinking, why not me? I was thinking, she loves me unconditionally. The house we shared always felt like home. And I thought we were best friends. Surely I can't be the only person who feels like weddings are a bit of a rejection. Two people announcing in public that they love each other more than they love you. Don't get me wrong, I love weddings, she says. I really do. I may not have a serious boyfriend right now, but I'm still a red-blooded American woman. I can happily spend hours debating wrist corsages versus pin corsages, Vera Wang versus Monique Louie. The fact that I can spell Monique Louie proves my point. How can anyone dislike a custom that involves dressing up, eating cake, and dancing to Journey? There's no denying that weddings change friendships forever. Priorities have been declared in public. She'll be there for him in sickness and in health till death do they part. She'll be there for you on your birthday and when he has to work late. Being platonically dumped wouldn't be so bad if people would acknowledge you have the right to be platonically heartbroken. But it's not just part of our vocabulary. However much our society may pay lip service to friendship, the fact remains that the only love it considers important, important enough to merit a public celebration, is romantic love. That's Carrie English, A Bridesmaid's Lament. When I was working in young adult ministry at a previous church, Probably the book that I recommended most to young adults and to some of their parents was by psychologist Meg Jay entitled The Defining Decade. She's not writing as a Christian, and to be honest, in many cases, that's really helpful because she provides uh, reasonable, rational, data-driven rationales for many of the same things that we Christians are used to only hearing in moral categories. She talks about the age 30 deadline uh, that 
unspoken cultural pact we have that certain milestones will be achieved by age 30. She says, in my experience, the age 30 deadline is more of an age 30 bait and switch. Everything that was okay at 29 suddenly feels awful, and in an instant, we feel behind. Almost overnight, commitment changes from being something for later to being something for yesterday. Marriage goes from being something we'll worry about at 30 to being something we want at 30. When, then, is the time to really think about partnership? This sudden shift can lead to all kinds of trouble. In short, that the trouble, this sudden shift from ass not that significant to it's suddenly urgent, the main trouble is that it limits intentionality. That overnight change can cause panic and it leads people out of anxiety to attempt to find something, really someone, that sticks and quick. Today's our uh, second to last Sunday in this series on Christian friendship. Today we're looking at friendship and dating. Can't really talk about dating without talking about singleness. And next week, my good friend, Pastor Ryan Casey from Horizon Church is going to be speaking on singleness. Uh, we've coordinated, but there will be a somewhat, I think, is helpful overlap, so it's probably best to view these two talks as a bit of a pair. Before we go further, I want to spend a few moments just surveying the dating landscape. David Kinnaman, uh, in his book, uh, You've Lost Me, was not talking specifically about dating, but I think his observation applies. He says, we're living in a time of unprecedented change. Sure, each generation is different than the one that goes before it, but this change today is so much faster than change before. He says, there is a discontinuous rate of change. This means that arguably there's more similarity between the dating landscape that my parents occupied in the 1970s and the dating terrain that Jill and I navigated in the late aughts than there is between that dating landscape and the dating landscape today, only 10 years later. Here are quick four observations. The first, the ideal marriage age has pushed later. Convergence of a burgeoning knowledge economy followed by the economic turndown globally in 2008-2010 time frame, which pushed a lot of young adults to stay in school longer, further credential, followed by an economic recovery in the last five or years or so, which has led young people to throw themselves completely into careers, to climb the ladder, make hay while the going is good, has combined to mean that marriage has been pushed later. This, of course, isn't the first time in history that it's happened, but many young people today begin the serious quest of dating toward marriage later, when they and their peers are more solidly situated in a career, more solidly rooted in responsibilities, and when you are more personally formed. All of these are good things, but their net effect is less flexibility than prior generations. According to a 2018 article in Women's Health magazine based on the latest census data, the average marriage age in the United States today is the latest it's ever been. Number two, liquid relationships, increased geographic mobility, and the technology revolution has contributed to less viscous, more liquid, more fluid relationships. Sociologist Zygmunt Bowman, from whom I've borrowed the term liquid relationships, puts it this way. Like the old style work that is split nowadays into a succession of flexible times, odd jobs, or short-term projects, the gig economy, and like the old style property purchase or lease that tends to be replaced these days with timeshare occupation and package holidays, the old style till death do us part marriage, already elbowed out by the self-admittedly temporary we'll see how it works out cohabitation, is replaced by a part-time, flexible times, comings together. That's Sigmund Bowman in Liquid Love. His observation in that chapter is about uh, sexual liaisons, hookups, but the book uh, pertains to relationships of all kinds. If you want a picture of this, some of you can see a thumbnail sketch of this evolution in the evolution of the reality game show Survivor. Some of you have seen a few of those uh, episodes or seasons over the 19 years that it's been in existence. In the first season, 
in an effort not to get voted out off the island and in an effort to amplify his or her own vote, somebody imported the idea of alliances, which were these uh, relationships of more or less loyalty that were usually forged early in the game and were intended to run uh, often deep or very much to the end. By around season 25 or so, the vocabulary of alliances had given way to something they called voting blocks, as small groups of people broke and rearranged alliances almost daily as best suited their needs and the shifting gameplay. By the time you get to current seasons, voting blocks have given way to even more fluid relationships of immediacy and pragmatism. So while Jeff Probst at the, at the uh, tribal council is interviewing a contestant, the others are whispering behind him or in front of her, sometimes even getting up out of their seats to go have a chat to form new and momentary relationships for the purposes of the imminent vote. I'm not making a moral comment here, I'm simply observing that the relationship framework in which dating occurs is becoming increasingly fluid. Number three, dating apps. Between 2005 and 2012, I realize that's old data, one third of all couples who got married in the United States met on the internet. I'm sure it's a higher percentage now. In a message on sexual formation, as part of our Joseph series, we talked about the rise of Tinder and other dating apps, so I'm not gonna belabor this point here. It's enough, though, to say that two major positive contributions of the online dating world have inadvertently influenced the dating culture in a depersonalizing direction. Here's what I mean. One of the great gifts of dating apps and websites is that they dramatically increase the pool of potential dates. Aziz Ansari in his book, Modern Romance, says, one gentleman we interviewed said he was overwhelmed by the enormous number of single women who were suddenly accessible. I was literally addicted to it, he recounted. Particularly if you're a Christian, hoping to marry another follower of Jesus and therefore committed to only dating other Christians, this is really helpful. Otherwise, your options are like the three guys in your small group, one of whom you've already dated, the other who's dating your best friend, and then the other guy. So. <laughs> The increased access of dating websites is a net positive. Also, the increased efficiency of sorting on dating apps and websites is really helpful. In years gone by, the main way to increase your pool of eligible dates was to hang out in new places or to risk blind dates that your friends set up for you. But in both of those scenarios, you had to invest substantial amounts of time in getting to know someone who was formerly unknown before you could even ascertain whether or not this might be someone that you want to begin a relationship towards marriage with. Helpful thoughtful profiles on dating apps make the process of screening and sorting these unknowns much more efficient. It's no surprise though that the market factors of increased access and increased efficiency, a lower perceived relational and time costs, leads together to an increased culture of disposability. And Sari interviews one woman who recalled being so hooked on Tinder that as she was on her way to a date, she was swiping to see if there was another more attractive guy out there to meet up with her in case her existing date was a bust. This unintended byproduct, a cultural depersonalization of other bearers of the image of God, is one of the more damaging features of the current dating landscape. Number four. We're almost done with the survey. Shrinking live pools for Christians. Three features I've outlined so far obtain equally for Christians and not yet Christians. This last feature is particularly poignant and drives much of the anxiety for Christians. The live dating pools are shrinking. The failure of the church, of church leaders like me to lead a next generation deep into the life of Jesus has contributed to a mass exodus of millennials and i Jenners from many churches. So today there are simply fewer self-identifying Christians to date. Add to that fact that 
in post-Christian urban centers like Baltimore, most new churches look a lot like St. Mo's, small. And that means that the number of dateable Christian men or women with whom you are in regular contact is much smaller than yesteryear of 300 uh, strong singles ministries. The crunch is even more acute for women. Churches tend to have more women than men, and although leadership positions are often occupied by men, the women are, in general, anecdotally more committed in attending. Sam did some preliminary demographic work on our database in Slack, and here at St. Mo's, single women outnumber single men roughly two to one. In many churches, the gender imbalance is closer to seven or eight to one. So women, you're in the right church. (laughs) Men, invite your friends. I take the time to share this, not because I think it's anything to be anxious or depressed about, but because we are a church family. And those of us who are not in the current dating landscape cannot adequately be empathetic and cannot adequately be prayerful for those of us who are in the dating landscape unless we are giving time to understand it and if we're not just assuming that it's the same as when we were dating. And for those of you who are in the dating landscape just now, this picture shouldn't evoke anxiety for you, but I hope it does elicit real intentionality. I want to go now to our first teaching text, and then we'll draw the second in later in a moment when we move to practicalities. Here it is again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 32 through 35. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him, but a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. I haven't yet had someone ask for this text at their wedding and you don't often hear it preached on. And that latter bit, I think, is at least in part because we don't know what to do with the fact that in this passage, the thrust of Paul's message seems to be counter-testimony to the loud shout of marriage affirmation that fills other pages of the Bible and so many sermons in churches St. Mo's not accepted. Paul seems to be urging that the life of singleness which was Jesus, the perfect human's profile status, just to remind you, and Paul's own profile status, is not only worthwhile and fulfilling, but in many cases is to be preferred to the married life. One of the marriage books I recommended to you a few weeks ago didn't know what to do with this passage other than to say the net effect of it is to make people who are on the path towards marriage stop and check themselves. But it's patently saying more than that, isn't it? It's a deep, deep affirmation of singleness. And most helpfully, I think Paul resists uplifting either marriage or singleness at the expense of the other and points instead to the ways that both of them, in their respective ways, are meant to be about serving God. Paul scholars and other first century historians wrangle over the backdrop of this chapter to help us understand it. Some have suggested that Paul is expecting Jesus to return and very soon and therefore streamlined relationships make the most sense. Others uh, like sociologist and historian Bruce Winter have pointed to localized famines and have suggested that a grain shortage in the area uh, may be alluded to in the previous verse in verse 31 left people in a sort of Y2K on Red Bull panic. They're imagining this apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic landscape, lava flowing, zombies marching, and if that's the scene, having an infant under one arm and a toddler in hand on the other arm uh, is a bit of a liability. It's best to be able to run single and fast as your little legs will carry you. 
But given that we can't verify all that, uh, I'm not sure that that latter interpretation is fully justified. But regardless, Paul's understanding of what it looks like to walk wholeheartedly in the way of Jesus in a moment of cultural upheaval included space for being married, it included space for being single, and it included space for moving from being single to being married, which in our day is dating. Furthermore, he leaves room for there being reasons not to get married, even if the cultural momentum and your own desires are toward marriage. For New Testament scholar Wesley Hill and others like Vaughn Roberts, pastor of St. Ebbs in Oxford, this is precisely the quandary they arrived in. Both of these men found themselves to be sexually and romantically attracted primarily to other men. And perhaps this is your experience. Maybe you've grown up around the church and perhaps homosexuality has been joked about and derided in the way it certainly was in my schools growing up but in churches with the added barb of Christian superciliousness. Gay is gross and sinful. Maybe you've heard yourself saying some of the same cruel and withering things, even at the same time as you've been increasingly in private identifying as gay or attracted to people of your own sex. And others of you might have grown up outside the church or in churches that affirm homosexuality, and now on your journey of following Jesus and of reading the scriptures for yourself, you're just not sure how to square up gay marriage and the teaching of the Bible. Although today's message is a message on friendship and dating, I want to make sure to take the time today to say to you, if you've been hurt by unloving words and actions from the church because you're gay, that I'm sorry. We in the church have often, I think, acting more out of fear than out of the love of Jesus, said and done things that were cruel and hurtful. Jesus is always loving. Furthermore, if you identify as gay, you're very welcome at St. Mo's. My intent is always to unpack the teaching of Scripture in a loving and a faithful way. The faithful bit means that at St. Mo's, we reserve the right for the scripture to say things that challenge us, all of us, including me. Things that call us out, things that correct our thinking, things that point us back to Jesus. And the loving bit means that even those most challenging pieces, I should be communicating with deep tenderness and humility. And this is where West Hill and Vaughn Roberts and other gay people I deeply admire are so helpful. They arrived at the tension between this inner pull toward romantic and sexual union with a same-sex partner, an outward cultural push toward marriage and toward doing the thing that came advertised as making them happy, and on the other hand, an abiding trust in Jesus, growing deeper in each year in following him and of experiencing his faithfulness and his limitless love. And the brave decision that those men and some of you have made, and what I believe to be the choice that's faithful to scripture and honoring to God is embracing a life of celibate singleness out of devotion to Jesus. And one of the factors that makes this choice even more painful is what we've been talking about in this series. In our culture, and by and large also in the church, we've lost sight of deep, committed Christian friendships. And this means that for gay people who are committed to following Jesus in their celibacy, it often feels like choosing to follow Jesus is also choosing to sign up for a life without deep relating to any other human. And that's a false choice. And we as the church family must repent from setting the table that way. And we have to work to recover a wider and a deeper imagining of Christian friendships. In part, out of love for our gay brothers and sisters in Christ. And here, I want to point you to Wes Hill's little gem of a book, Spiritual Friendship, Finding Love in the Church as a Celibate Gay Christian. He writes faithfully, deeply, beautifully, and after Julie Canlis, he was the most helpful individual to me in this whole series on friendship. Okay, we've got to return uh, to our main theme. Next week, um, 
Ryan, I think, will dig into some of Wes Hill's historical work on deep, thick, non-sexual, but intimate, committed, enduring relationships, friendships, and I think that could be quite helpful to us. To my mind, there are two um, undercurrents to avoid in Christian dating, if you're into uh, Greek mythology, a, a Scylla and a Charybdis, if you will. The first one is to idolize marriage. That is, as a single person dating, to imagine marriage and your spouse will be your fulfillment. Your, we don't need the graphic just yet. Your answer, your completion. You're laughing at my graphic. It was, it was, it was strong. <laughs> You're fantas fantasizing about your marriage and about your spouse that runs the risk of dislocating you from yourself right now as you live in an imaginary future with an imaginary perfect spouse. That's one undercurrent. The other is to idolize freedom. You think you probably want to get married. You enjoy dating. But once a relationship starts to grow roots or once the other person begins to have expectations, expressed or unexpressed, legitimate or illegitimate, you begin to get a little itchy on the soles of your feet because you're worried that your fulfillment is short roped to your freedom. More than anything, you want to be unconstrained. Okay, you can put up my awesome drawing now. Both of these tendencies, you might have noticed already, are just flip sides of the same coin of self-actualization within the context of dating. And when they've both developed a head of steam, they have the caustic power of objectification. In the first, idolizing marriage, we depersonalize our partner as an object of romantic fantasy. And in the other one, where we're idolizing our freedom, being unconstrained, we depersonalize our partner as an object of personal pleasure. And it's here that deep Christian friendships come into their own in dating. Here's the first way, and this is drawing on 1 Corinthians 7 reading. Deep Christian friendships develop, facilitate devotion to God. Even greater sometimes than the feeling of loneliness, that empty feeling if you're single, is the Turger pressure, the inward pressure pushing out of having love to give and no one to give it to. Have you ever experienced that? Not the loneliness of no one noticing when you get home at night, but the loneliness of having no one to notice when they get home at night. Christian friendships begin to meet this need and they root it in Christward devotion. Devotion to God is the goal that Paul holds up there in 1 Corinthians 7. If the goal of the married life in 1 Corinthians 5 is, above all the benefits of the married life, to wave this banner of God's sacrificial, loving faithfulness to us, then the goal of the single life, above all of its benefits, is devotion to God. So ultimately worthy, so fantastically worthy, lovely, so magnific magnificently honorable is God that he deserves the devotion of our singleness and even of our marriages because our marriages to one another will in the end be dissolved so that we can all participate in the ultimate wedding of persons to Christ. So there are different ways of enacting your devotion of singleness in worship, obviously, in generous giving, in extravagant acts of service with the additional time you might have. But one of the central ways that we enact our devotion to God through singleness is devotion to one another in Christian friendship. I'm paraphrasing John here at the end of 1 John 3. He says, the way we abide in God or the way we remain devoted to God is two things, believing in his son Jesus and being devoted to one another. Being devoted to one another. Our tendency, of course, is to think of love with a sort of poverty mindset. If I spend it over here, I'll have less to give over here. But any parent will tell you that they are loved when you love their kids. When you show love to their kids, that parent feels, loves, feels loved. 
devoting ourselves in deep Christian friendships with each other, single and married, and dating, is a prime way to express our devotion to the Father. Brian Loretz puts it this way, our relationships with each other are the indicator light of our relationship with God. Second way that Christian friendships lead us into devotion to God and away from idolizing marriage is that they ground us, they nail our feet to the floor of reality. Real people, real flaws, real relating, no fantasizing, no objectifying. Meg Jay, in that book I mentioned earlier, says that she's astonished by the number of her clients who tell her that they've been in long-term dating relationships or serial liaisons and none of their friends know anything about it. She says when she hears this, she immediately flags shame. One of my questions to every couple I'm marrying is, what are the names of two people who know both of you well and who have seen your relationship and can tell me about it. When you bring your dating relationship into the sphere of your Christian friendships, you are giving your dating relationship the blessing of demystifying it and nipping fantasy in the bud. It's the job of your Christian friendships to help you get over your fantasy-induced blindness, to see your partner as real flesh and blood, bearer of the image of God, and to treat her that way or him that way, and to help you discern your suitedness together. This takes us back to our very first week in this series when St. Augustine talked to us about the double knowledge, knowing God and knowing ourselves, and knowing ourselves in light of the way God knows us. We can only rightly know ourselves in relationship. Your dating relationship needs the perspective of your Christian friends and family. The medical show, New Amsterdam, uh, that Jill tells me is just for older middle-aged people like us. Brilliant thoracic surgeon Dr. Reynolds took his elegant and high-powered attorney girlfriend Evie home for family dinner after church. And he sees this moment alone in the kitchen with his mom when he asked her for the family ring to propose to Evie. And his mom's insight was so poignant. She said, she's the perfect woman, just not the perfect woman for you. Help your dating friends be fully devoted to God by cultivating deep friendships where your devotion to each other is of a piece with your devotion to God. Include your gay and single friends dismantling the false perception that faithfulness to God means necessarily passing up on deep relating and enlist your Christian friends in defantasizing your dating relationships. Here's the application for the flip side of the coin. This is drawing on our second teaching text, Romans 12, 9 through 13. Deep Christian friendships lead us toward treating our partners as true friends. When we idolize our freedom in our dating relationships, we end up depersonalizing the person we're dating. And one of the reasons this happens is, have you noticed, no one refers to your boyfriend except for your grandmother when she's not yet sure if she approves of him, as your friend. It's always the guy you're seeing, the girl I'm talking to, the person I'm hanging out with, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend. But each of these titles and all of the other ones we could come up with punt the person you're intentionally dating with a view toward marriage outside of the realm of friend. That should give us pause. Because just as a husband and wife are specialized forms of friendship, but they're certainly not less than friendship. Your boyfriend and your girlfriend are also specialized cases of friendship, but they should not be, cannot be viewed or treated as less than friends. We think we don't, because the title girlfriend and boyfriend seems special. But the truth is we regularly treat our significant others in ways that we would not treat a friend. This is where that Romans 12 passage is so helpful. You can put up the grid uh, for me, please, Sam. You can run the Romans 12 grid on your dating. Is there a grid? Tell me there's a grid. There's no grid. Awesome. You want to see the one I've drawn? 
you're going to love it. <laughs> so open your Bibles with me. Look at Romans 12, verses 9 through 13. Just let these verses be your check. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Are you, are you being authentic in your relationship or are you leading him or her on? Have you let him or her know what page you're on? That's the language Jill and I always used in our relationship. That's verse 9. Verse 10. Love each other with genuine affection. Is it genuine affection? Are, are you treating him or her at least as well as you would treat one of your closest friends? Delight in showing one another honor. Delight in showing one another honor. Run this grid on your dating relationship. If you break up two weeks from now, three weeks from now, yes, there's going to be emotional fallout and you're going to have to work through that because that's painful. But are you honoring one another such that she's being built up in her identity as a beloved daughter of God and he's being built up in his identity as a beloved son of God. So even if the relationship parts and you become just friends, you are friends who have delighted in honoring each other. Be constant in prayer. Are you seeking God's guidance on this relationship? Are you praying for the person you're dating or are you just late night texting? Are you praying for her future spouse? Are you praying for your future spouse? Are you bringing this special friendship to the Lord in prayer? Are you treating him or her in such a way that you're already depending on the disposability perception in our cultural moment? Or are you treating one another as dear brothers and sisters, beloved friends in Christ. The way that people move from singleness to marriage varies across the centuries and across the cultures, and we're in a particular cultural moment with all of its advantages and all of its disadvantages. But by my perception, today, if you are dating and committed to dating in a way that is faithful to Jesus and loving to others, or if you are single today and are committed to being celibate and single today in a way that is faithful to Jesus and loving to others, you are going to stand out as a bit of a contrast in a society that is marked by unprecedented levels of narcissism, of utilitarianism, of individualism and isolation. And one of the features of feeling like you are a contrast is feeling like you're a pioneer and feeling lonely, like you're all on your own. I want to tell you this morning, just as we close, that you're not. You're not. And increasingly, you must not be. You should not be at St. Mo's. As we lean on the resources of the Bible and of church history and beg God's help in developing thick, deep, abiding, intimate, committed Christian friendships between single people and married people and married people and single people and gay people and straight people, men and women. We provide a family in which you are seen and known and supported even as you are doing these brave, brave, often difficult and seemingly lonely things. I want to close by just praying a prayer of blessing uh, over those of you who are dating right now. And I hope, again, that you don't feel anxiety around this, but that instead you feel known and loved and deeply dependent on God as the one who is your source. Let me pray and then I'll, uh, Pastor Sam can come up and lead us into communion. Father, as a church family, we come here together before you. I know we've talked about some challenging things this morning that uh, might have landed different ways with different ones of us. And I just pray for your grace, that you would come here by your spirit, be among us, and that for those uh, brave people today who are dating and trying to do so in a way that is fully devoted to Jesus, in a way that shines your light, that is loving, 
and filled with integrity. I pray that you would give them the gift that you gave to the prophet. There are still others. You're not alone. There are 700 others doing the same thing. And for those who are single and uh, committed to singleness and to celibate singleness out of devotion for you, Father, I pray that you would give them courage and resilience and that you would provide even in this church and beyond this church deep, robust, life-giving, upholding, fulfilling, nurturing Jesus' word friendships with other single people and with married people and with people older and younger. Father, we pray. We pray for your spirit to do something powerful in this church. And uh, in a way that goes against the grain of our cultural moment, help us to begin investing in relationships that go deeper than we have before. Give us an imagination for something that we don't often see in our day. And would you help us be patient with one another and courageous in building it here and in holding it out as a gift of hospitality to others. We pray this in Jesus' name.